Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talk about? Well, I want to talk about trading in a word. And instead of trying to explain that, let's just hop in to everything. Before we do that, housekeeping, I do take requests. If there's something you want me to cover, as I've been saying at nauseam, please email me. And what I have been doing mostly lately is covering it in my Thursday show, which is a little bit more free form. And I could take a little bit more time and get into a lot of the, the Q&A there. So feel free to shoot me a question, davelander.com slash contact, if you want something covered. If you want the slides from this show and all of the other shows that I've done, 50-something of them, go to davelander.com slash stock charts, put your information in, and I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff to keep you busy for a long time, including all three of my books, so you can get to know me and the methodology. I noticed David Keller mentioned this book a while back, and I started reading it, and I didn't finish it, but one thing that struck a chord with me, and the reason I didn't finish it, I got busy doing these mar morning pages, and in the book it says that you should write three pages free form, and David Keller also mentioned the second book, which I just started reading, and that's The Artist's Way for Business, Riding the Dragon, I believe, by Julie, Julie Cameron. And she has some co-authors on that one. And they talk a lot about the morning pages and everything they say I've experienced with them. And I did these many, many years ago. And I don't know why I quit. I wish I wouldn't have because I can go back and see what I was thinking back then. But my thinking now is, I know I never say never, but I think I'm going to do these for the rest of of my life and I could probably talk for 45 minutes just on this this has been a wonderful exercise and after we go through today's presentation I'll probably mention again a lot of your problems can be fleshed out with this now this is one of my better pages so to speak where I was messing around with my little ACP Landry light indicator that's what LL means here and you could see that I did a little doodling and scratching and Thought about some formulas and way to trade it. And nothing has really come of this yet. But you can see where my head was on this particular day a couple of weeks ago. Now, it's not always this fantastic. Sometimes it's like uh, the dog farted and I'm talking about that or whatever. I'm, I'm putting some shelves in the garage. And, and before you know it, I spent three pages talking about the shelves that I'm going to put in and how I'm going to build them, etc. Anyway, whether you have a day like this where a lot comes out of it or a day where... Not a whole lot comes out of it. Those thoughts are still in your head. And it's good to get them out of your head. And when you get to work, you kind of hit the ground running. And I work out a lot of issues through these pages. The other day, I mentioned to my wife, I get more done between, I wake up at 4.55 every morning. And I said, I get more done between 5 and 8 than I do the whole rest of the day. And she says, even when you spend all that time writing and I was taken back a little bit. You know, you guys, your wife can kind of humble you a little bit or whatever or kind of say something and you have to like really think about it. You're like, mm -hmm. And no, even in taking all this time, I'm more productive during the day because I get all these thoughts out of my head, what I need to focus on, what I'm missing, etc. Now, anyway, you can tell I'm, I, I know I'm a nerd, but this is going to change your life if you start these morning pages and if you read the maybe start with the second book the artist way for business because in there they really talk a lot about what you're going to experience with these morning pages and it's going to help get you through them the first six weeks are going to be brutal in doing these believe me but if you can make it through six weeks you could probably make it through the rest of your life anyway long story endless in doing this i was thinking about what i was going to do for my show here today and i said well you know Along the lines of solving your trading problems, which we've been talking about quite a bit, both in this show and the other show, and, and, and most of those problems can be solved by something fairly simple, which all boils down to the basics of trading. So I'm like, what if I rewound trading to the beginning and talked about the basics again and how all those problems can be solved, or at least 90% of them, through the basics? And as I was doing the thinking and writing in the morning, I came up with the idea, what if I had to sum up trading in one word? Well, that word would be acceptance. And I'm not sure 
how long or how how long we can go or how many episodes, I should say, we're going to do with this acceptance. But I think each one concept can be a presentation in and of itself. In fact, some of the things we're going to discuss today have already been a complete presentation in and of itself. So let's talk about some things that you need to accept. You need to accept the fact that the only way to make money in the markets is to capture a trade. So let's say you buy, and it could be one of my patterns, such as a pullback, when the market begins to rally out of the pullback. And let's call that point A, and then you sell higher. Let's call that point B. Well, from A to B is a trend. Now, when I tell people that you have to sell higher than you buy in order to make money, people look at me like I pooed my pants. Kind of like that look they give you in Starbucks if you walk in there and ask for a cup of coffee. Years ago, I did that. I don't get out, as I often say, I don't get out much. And when I do, it's usually somewhere where the coffee is much better, somewhere other than a coffee chain. But you have to sell higher than you buy. And you have to capture a trend. Now, why do people fight trends? People try to outsmart the markets. People try to outthink. And there's also a psychology, and it's hard to buy a market at 20 that's trending nicely when just a few weeks ago it might have been trading at 10. You're not going to look smart as a trend follower. In fact, that's one that I'll probably add in in upcoming episodes, except the fact that as a trend follower, you're not going to look smart. Initially, when I was called a trend-following moron, I was offended and deeply hurt because the person I had a tremendous amount of respect for. And then I realized maybe I am just a trend-following moron. Anytime I tried to outsmart the market, I lost money. And anytime I just followed the trend, uh, not all the time, but often, I made money. Now, a big one to accept is the fact that you don't no, okay? Nobody knows exactly what a market will do next, as I often say, not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. And neither does anyone else, and especially me. I, I'll admit it right away. Think about it. If I knew where a market was headed exactly, you'd probably never see my fat arse again. And think about all these YouTube gurus, gurus with trading, and they don't really know where... A market is headed and they don't have the secret nobody has a secret the secret is there is no secret now years ago tom mcclellan spoke in new orleans at the american association of professional technical analysts meeting he's a fellow member and he was given a speech about a stock versus a company and he was explaining that it's more important to be concerned with the action in the stock than the company, and more specifically, the people who bought the stock prior to you or really of your biggest concern because those people will screw you. Now, I've taken the ball and ran with it. I hope I got my tense right. My wife will correct me later if not. <laughs> and I told Tom how often I quote him on that. He says, I'll do you one better. Everyone uses timing in their investments. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, while others use far more sophisticated methods. And that's from his late mother, Mary McClellan, one of my favorite quotes when it comes to the markets. And I quoted it out of my head. It might be a little bit different. It might be trading instead of investments, but you get the idea. And if you think about it, earlier this year, we had all these little go-go stocks going absolutely nuts. And the reason was because the government gave out this stimulus money and a lot of the, I'm guessing, younger folk who, with their little Robinhood accounts. And the reason we know that a lot of money came from there is that Robinhood accounts, I think, quadrupled over that period of time when those stimulus funds were going out. And all that money dumped into the market. What happened when they dumped that money into the market? Well, these go-go stocks took off. And why did it happen? Well, they bought because they had money. It had nothing to do with the market itself. It had nothing to do with fundamentals. My brother-in-law is always talking about this medical company and their technology and how it's going to be really great. He's in that business. 
And I would explain, that's all fine and dandy, but the market is the final arbiter, and the market trades purely on emotions. And we would go back and forth quite a bit. And then an interesting thing happened this year, not too long ago. Thanks to COVID, he wasn't able to get out and see clients as much, and also he had a lot of time working from home. And he started watching the market, and before you know it, he got sucked into day trading. And then the next time I saw him, which was a few weeks ago, he said, man, you're right. <laughs> Markets just trade on emotions. Now, one thing you have to accept is that the fact that trading goes against human nature from a neurological standpoint. Now, from a psychological standpoint, it also goes against you. And I'll mention that in a few minutes. And that's something I'm going to spend a lot of time on in upcoming episodes and have already in the past. But from a neurological perspective, that's, at least for me, that was even more of an epiphany because you might argue that we have a different psychology when it comes to trading. And we do to some extent, but there's more common ground than not. We all sort of make the same mistakes. I have the luxury of seeing a lot of these mistakes being made through my educational business. Now, why is that a luxury? Well, it reminds me not to do the same thing. I'm going to show you one mistake in a little while that I did the same mistake a few weeks prior and seeing a couple other gentlemen make the same mistake says, oh, I'm not going to make that same mistake again. Not only have I made the mistake, but I see other people make it and it's a, it serves as a constant reminder. Now, from a neurological standpoint, one thing you have to wrap your head around, there's a couple things to wrap your head around. There's a lot more to it than what I'm going to say, obviously, in a small presentation here. But here are two things that are going to get you started to wrap your head around the neurology. Because you could argue that we have a different psychology, and again, we don't. But the reality is we all have the same neurology. Our brains all work the same way. And along those lines, all decisions have an emotion attached about... Eight years ago, I was speaking in San Francisco, and Denise Shaw spoke before me, and she talked about the fact that it's a universal axiom, I guess, or whatever, adage, to separate your emotions from your trading. Well, the bottom line is, you can't make any decisions without emotions. Every decision has an emotion attached, even what you're going to have for lunch today. And it's kind of funny. I was thinking about lunch when I was getting ready to record, and I got hungry when I ate lunch, but it's like... Okay, I could go out and get some fast food because I'm sick of leftovers, but that's going to take time, and then I'm going to have less time to record, then it'll be rush this afternoon, plus fast food's bad for you, and I'm fat enough as it is, and not P-H-A-T, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to, I'll just eat some leftovers, take me 10 minutes, and I'll come right back here to record, I know, you can, <laughs> my lunch stories are fascinating, you probably want to party with me, but the bottom line, the point I'm trying to make is that all decisions have an emotion attached. Now here's the clincher which kind of comes into all this is that a negative emotion has twice the impact as a positive one and one client of mine seems to think it's more like 10 times and I would say at least two times. I've actually seen in writing two and a half times but for the most part throughout a lot of these books that I've read on this they seem to agree on two times. Anyway the point I'm trying to make is that a negative emotion has twice the impact as a positive one. And this is what leads to gamblers ruin. They're, they're chasing that high. And it's kind of interesting. Um, somebody had just called me and they said, have you seen Molly's game? And I'm like, yeah. You know, and he explains about the one guy that kind of blew up. And he goes, that reminds me of me. And it's interesting. This guy was a really good poker player, but he started to blow up. And he was trying to chase that high. He was trying to overcome that negative emotion and that's what causes the gambler's ruin you win a little money you feel good but then you lose a little bit you feel really bad you're trying to get that good feeling again and you never quite get that high and that all involves dopamine and i'm going to give you a book here to read on that in one second in fact let's talk about that now so this book here didn't really relate directly to trading but it's kind of an owner's manual and my wife, I would talk a lot about this going on, this thing in your brain, why you do this and all. And my wife's like, where'd you learn that? Let me guess, that book on the brain. And I'm like, yeah. So this is very worthwhile reading for life and in trading. Denise Shaw, who I mentioned a minute ago, 
I would recommend you read Market Mind Games. The critics kind of beat this book up a little bit, at least on Amazon, but I thought it was pretty good. In fact, it had me kind of longing for more. I think she could have fleshed things out a little more, and it's kind of strange, and I'm almost thinking, like, what if Malcolm Gladwell got together with Denise Shaw and, and took, you know, picked her brain and wrote the stories, and it would have been really, really amazing. But I, I think there's a lot here in this book, and I would strongly recommend you read it. And this one on the right, I started reading last night through kind of uh, kind of a tangent from the Kirk Report, Charlie Kirk. I saw this book was mentioned in the video, and it looked kind of interested. And I've only read a few pages, but so far I could see where the discussion of the dopamine is going to really dovetail in nicely with the trading. And a lot of our bad traits from a neurological standpoint are going to come from or we'll learn, I should say, come from the dopamine. We already know that because of the gambler's ruin, but I think this is going to kind of reaffirm things and kind of frame how we need to look at things. And again, I'm only kind of a few pages in, but I can kind of see where it's going. It's not the excitement of the thing that gets you excited. It's the excitement of acquiring the thing. So it's like you ever wanted something really bad and you finally get it, you're like, eh, you know, then you're off to wanting the next thing. And that's what dopamine does. Getting back to the negative versus the positive when it comes to emotions, case in point, I've done really well over the past couple of weeks, knock on wood, we hit a bunch of, when I say we, me and my Facebook peeps, caught a bunch of IPOs. We did okay in the trading service. We had one take off there and it felt pretty good, but my Excitement was tempered because I knew sooner or later we would have a bad day and today we're having a bad day and it's like I could feel it kind of really bumming me out. So all that excitement of those good days gets wiped out with one bad day, even though I'm still much higher than I was a week or so ago. So anyway, wrapping your head around neurology is really going to help your trading. I can't emphasize this enough. Once you know it's something concrete that we all have to deal with, trading becomes a lot easier. One thing that I've talked about a lot in the past and I'll probably continue to talk about and flesh out in a lot more detail in upcoming episodes is that you have to accept the fact that trading goes against human nature from a psychological standpoint. And as just one case in point, I remember in many presentations I, I would always say, I don't understand. Why do these same people who are so successful in all these other careers, why do they choose such mediocre setups. And then finally, one day a psychiatrist said, I think I have your answer. She's also a trader and a client. And she gave me a very long answer, which I explained in one of the prior shows. But the bottom line is that in your line of work, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an automatic transmission mechanic, which are the examples I often give, as she said, you have to take whatever train wreck comes along. Waiting for the per perfect pitch is not in their mindset. And that's Dr. J who was saying these things. So in trading, it goes against that. You have to wait until you have a really good setup. You also, along the same lines, have to be very, very patient. Now, in your current or prior career, you're not going to get paid to sit on your butt. But in trading, you'll often have to do just that. I did a screen capture a few minutes ago. This is the trading service for today. At the bottom, you see the setups. Notice it says none. I looked at yesterday's, which I knew was none, and the day before, which was Friday, and then I kept going back and back and back until I found where I had recommended some setups. I recommended three setups way back at the end of October, and none of those triggered. So it's been probably almost a month since we've had any new positions. I think the last one was the CRSR. You could see back in the middle of October. I remember years ago, and I've told the story ad nauseum, so let me just kind of get through it quickly <laughs> for the sake of my existing clients that are watching. But years and years ago, I was part of the first website. It was only us and one other website out there when it comes to the financial markets. And I had a trading service, the same trading service actually. And when there was nothing to do, I'd recommend nothing. And then they had salesmen back there and the salesman called me up and they would say, Dave, you got to recommend something. I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything. Why should anybody else do something? And I found out really quickly that if I recommended stocks that turned into turds, then 
I might lose a few clients, but I didn't lose many clients. But if I did not recommend doing anything because there was nothing to do, you know, first do no harm. I forget the Latin for that, prenum non cheri or something, the doctor's creed, so to speak. Then we would lose clients because obviously people were craving action. And that's just human nature. Along the lines of the markets trading only on emotions, kind of getting back to the thinking with my brother-in-law, is that you have to accept that the market does not make sense. And at the last minute, I put, doesn't often make sense because sometimes it'll actually do what it's supposed to do. But more often than not, it'll do something that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And that's where I often say, don't confuse the issue with facts. It's kind of like Chewbacca theory. Now, as you know, Chewbacca is from Kaizik, right? And he lives on Indoor. Now, Indoor is full of a bunch of Ewoks. Now, Chewbacca is eight feet tall, okay? And those Ewoks are like two foot tall. And he lives on a planet full of a bunch of little Ewoks that are two foot tall. It makes no sense. Well, markets are like Chewbacca theory, which I stole from South Park. <laughs> now, all kidding aside, markets often don't make any sense. And if you're willing to, to wrap your head around that, wrap your head that they just trade on emotions. And one way, as I've said quite a bit, to wrap your head around that is think about your own emotions, okay? Think about what you're feeling in any given trade, okay? I just got stopped out of one literally while I was recording this, and I felt the emotion of that. I felt the emotion of the stock dropping. When you'll see one of my mistakes that I made in a few minutes, or in next episode, if we don't get to it today, I had emotions involved in that decision. Well, that's no shocker. And I reasoned, I don't want to lose any more money. I'm tired of losing money on this position. I'm out. And that affected my judgment. So just realize that the markets trade on emotions. And once you wrap your head around your own emotions and your own trading and your own emotions in life, for that matter, your trading is going to get a lot easier because you'll realize, like the Chewbacca theory, it makes no sense. It is what it is. Either it's going up, it's going down, or it's going sideways. Now, you have to accept the fact that as a trend follower, you will spend a lot of your time less wealthy. I borrowed that term less wealthy from fortune's formula if you if you trade the kelly farm then you might you'll probably blow up but it's a great way to either parlay your account or blow it up but without digressing too far i stole that term from that book and i thought it's a pretty good term for trend following now let me give you a let me give you a case in point and i probably should have picked a trade to turn into a big winner but i thought it'd be kind of fun to show you something live and we'll see what happened to make for a great example but the blue line here is where we got in 39.75, if memory serves. And it triggered in the first three or four or five days, about a week, we're underwater. Anything above the blue line is negative, and anything below it is a positive. We could see that after sitting at the stock for about a week, it finally dipped below the blue line, the entry, in other words. And we were back in black, or in the green, so to speak. And then what happened? It meanders back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for weeks. And then drops back below the entry. So once again, we're profitable on the trade. So we're profitable enough to where we begin the trail to stop lower a little bit in attempt to ride a longer term trend. Then what happens? It rallies, it rallies, it rallies, it rallies, which is a bad thing if you're short, right? Almost comes cl close to stopping us out and then begins to implode. So 32 days in the trade, and only eight of those days we were profitable from the entry. So that means that 75% of the time in this trade we were underwater, and take it one step further, half of those days, half of those eight days, were giving up open profit. So obviously we had that first green day, and then you look at some days over here, we gave up some open profits and gave up open profits and gave up open profits. Every day that it trades higher, we're giving up those open profits. So the majority of the time was spent underwater. Greg Morris once said that a market only makes new highs about 
four percent of the time. And the rest of the time, it's backing and filling. So one of the things I thought about my morning page this morning was, what if I went in and made an indicator plus one in green if you're hitting new one-year highs and minus one if you're not hitting one-year high. So you're anywhere below a one-year high. And this is on a closing basis, okay? Not just a high high, but a closing high. And you can see pretty quickly that Greg's right. Only about 4% of the time is the market making new highs. Now, if you look at this market, do you think that the market is higher than where it started or lower? Well, there's not a whole lot of green in here. There's not a whole lot of new one-year highs. So one would have to wonder if it's positive at all. Well, it is. This is the spiders going back 10 years. And although I don't preach buy and hope, but if you'd have bought the spiders 10 years ago and held until yesterday, you would have made over 200% on your account. But you could see that a lot of time the market was backing and filling. Now, this really illustrates from a neurological standpoint the negative observations. Earlier I said a negative emotion, and I was talking about negative emotion from taking a loss, like the F-bomb I just dropped a few minutes ago when I just got stopped out, has twice the impact as a positive one. But if you're making a lot of observations, every observation still has a negative impact on you, and that negative impact is still twice the amount of a positive one. Now, today I didn't get back to the black, but I did recover quite a bit. And I looked at my portfolio pretty much all day today. And I was hoping, I know, hoping one hand and you know the other, but <laughs> I was hoping what would happen would be that I would, that negative portfolio would become a positive and I could talk to you today about how many negative observations I made throughout the day and how I put myself into that negative state of mind, into that state of regret, so to speak. And you have to realize that if you're not careful with understanding how markets work, how little they make new highs, and how more often than not you're going to have a negative observation, and quite often you'll be giving up those open profits, you could easily end up in a downward spiral, and that's neurology. Well, I'm out of time, and I knew this would happen. We're just scratching the surface here, but I'm going to follow up on this, and there's so much more that you need to know, and you need to wrap your head around and accept when it comes to acceptance. Again, if you need to reach me, DaveLeonard.com slash contact. If you want the slides from this presentation, all the other presentations, daylander.com slash stock charts. I want to thank everybody for watching and may the trend be with you. See you next week. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.